Well, good morning, loved ones. Morning. It's nice to be called that, isn't it? Yeah. That's what beloved means. It means loved ones. Anyway, the title of my talk this morning is When God Offends. When God Offends. Everything that Jesus did and said came from a heart of love, the, the Father's love revealed perfectly through him, and mostly that manifested in compassion and tenderness and gentleness, and we like and we understand that part. But sometimes on the other side of the divine coin, it manifested in offense. The Oxford Dictionary defines the word offend as to cause to feel upset, annoyed, or resentful. <clears throat> The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it as to cause a person or group to feel hurt, angry, or upset by something said or done. The earliest New Testament believers were, of course, Messianic Jews, men and women who were raised in the Jewish religion, in the Jewish traditions, in the Jewish culture. And Scripture states that the life is in the blood, Leviticus 3.17, and so eating blood was and still is a deeply offensive thing to a Jew. Hence their ritual slaughtering of animals which allows the blood to be drained from the meat. When Gentiles who knew little of the Jewish culture began to flood into the kingdom, some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees wanted them to be circumcised and this issue in particular brought brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute with them, as recorded in Acts 15. Eventually, the apostles and the elders met at Jerusalem to decide what wise stipulations they should lay upon the rapidly increasing number of Gentile believers. And after much debate, James, the stepbrother of Jesus, stood up and addressed the council, saying this, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it diff difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Why these four stipulations? One commentary on these verses says this, Circumcision was not required, but four stipulations were laid down. These were in areas where the Gentiles had particular weaknesses and where Jews were particularly repulsed by Gentile violations. It would help both the individual and the relationships between Gentile and Jew if these requirements were observed. So with this background information, it's not hard to understand how deeply offensive the idea of flesh being eaten with blood still in it would be even to the Messianic Jew. And we get that. Jesus was, raised, Jesus was Jewish, raised in a Jewish home in a Jewish land with Jewish traditions and a robust Jewish culture. And he knew, of course, that flesh with blood in it being eaten was offensive. So with that understanding, listen to Jesus addressing Jewish listeners in the synagogue in Capernaum, as recorded in John 6. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. What offense? And the crowd was offended, very offended, and so were his disciples. With great understatement, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? To which Jesus replied, does this offend you? So offensive were his words that we read. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, 
do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him on behalf of them all, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In other words, the disciples who did not walk away were definitely offended by his words, but they did not walk away as others did because they had truly come to believe <clears throat> that he was indeed the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus was not looking for fans. Jesus was looking for followers. John MacArthur put it well when he wrote, Modern conventional wisdom would suggest that Jesus ought to have done everything possible to exploit his fame, tone down the controversies that arose out of his teaching, and employ whatever strategies he could use to maximize the crowds around him. But instead of taking the populist route and exploiting his fame, he began to emphasize the very things that made his teaching so controversial. At about the time the crowds reached their peak, he preached a message so boldly confrontational and so offensive in its content that the multitude melted away, leaving only the most devoted few. After his death and resurrection, the disciples understood what Jesus had said. We know the words of 1 Corinthians 11 very well. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took a cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The clue in his original teaching was in the line, This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the world. Another example from Matthew chapter 15. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. The Jews regarded Gentiles as dogs, a deeply offensive term in their culture, as recorded in Matthew 7, 6. And Jesus had just publicly referred to her daughter as a little dog. How offensive was that? But listen to her reply. Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. To which Jesus responded, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. I like Matthew Henry's commentary on this event. He said, Those whom Christ intends most to honor, he humbles to feel their own unworthiness. A proud, unhumbled heart would not have borne this. Jesus was not looking for fans. Jesus was looking for followers. Another example from Luke chapter 4. In his hometown of Nazareth, he stood up in the synagogue, and after a reading from Isaiah, he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth and said, Is this not Joseph's son? So at that point, there was a fan club beginning to gather at his gracious words, but that was just for a moment. Then Jesus said to him, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent, except to, except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. He was speaking truth from 1 Kings 12 and 
2 Kings 5, but the people in the synagogue were so offended by the implications of his words, they threw him out of the synagogue, out of the city, and then tried to throw him off a cliff, as recorded in Luke 4. No fan club now, but no followers either. Another example from Mark chapter 10, from verse 17. A rich young ruler greatly admired Jesus, calling him good teacher, and clearly wanted confirmation that his law-keeping, righteous behavior would result in eternal life. But Jesus' response offends his own self-worth, and he walks away from Jesus, saddened and unchanged. Listen to the exchange. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false, false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And the young man said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross, and follow me. But the young man was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Though Jesus loved him, his words were, and always will be, non-negotiable. When trying to get eternal life, when trying to get salvation through your own self-righteousness, there will always be that one thing you lack. James mentioned that phrase in chapter 2 of James, which inevitably draws you to the conclusion that you need a savior, not just a good teacher. Jesus was not after his money. Jesus was after his heart. Jesus wasn't looking for fans. Jesus was looking for followers. Another example from Matthew 8. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> it is all too easy to present, as wonderfully described in Charles Wesley's famous hymn, Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild, with a full stop after that. It's all too easy to leave the potentially offensive and challenging words of Scripture aside because we do not want to upset or offend the congregation or the listeners. And by and large, that is what we have done. We have nurtured a fan club. As a result, we have an unsharpened church the full sword has not been applied to divide between spirit and soul. As Christians, we can get offended if we believe that God did not show up whenever we think he should have. It seems that even John the Baptist was offended and confused when Jesus did not show up and rescue him from Herod's jail. John sent two of his disciples to ask him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? To which Jesus replied, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. The apostle Peter was taken prisoner by Herod, but God broke him out of jail. John, the beloved's brother, James, was taken prisoner by Herod, but this time there was no release. Instead, as recorded in Acts 12, he was publicly beheaded. Was the apostle John offended that John, that God showed up for Peter, but not for his brother James? We don't know. But John did not walk away. And he ended up being used by Jesus to write the closing book in Scripture. Job was offended, but never let go of God. And in the end, he got double what he had lost. The 12 disciples nearly turned back, but didn't, and changed the world. Jesus continually offended the religious establishment of the day who sought to undermine what God was doing through him. After answering one of the scribes and Pharisees' questions, we read in Matthew 15, then his disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? 
And no wonder throughout the gospel, Jesus called them a brood of vipers, hypocrites, blind guides. He likened them to whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. In an effort to discredit him, they called him a glutton, a drunkard, a sinner's friend, and said his power came from Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And then they crucified him, not realized that he was dying for their sake, for their salvation, should they want it. His words were living water, and his presence was life to those who truly believed and responded accordingly, and offense and death to those who did not believe and responded accordingly. And it is so with us, his followers who carry his name on our lips and his spirit within us. Paul wrote to the church in 2 Corinthians 2.15, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. God's word is not a double-edged feather, but a double-edged sword, and it will always divide like a sword. The summit will be revelation and life to others. It will be offense and death, but it will always divide. And Jesus did not ignore this fact. In Matthew 10, 34, he said, Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. While Christendom was the predominant worldview in our Western culture, God's word did not greatly offend. Society, believers, and non-believers alike were soaked in Christian culture for generations. Queen Victoria once said to an African prince through his translator, tell your prince that this book, the Bible, is the secret of England's greatness. Our own Queen Elizabeth said to the nation, to what greater inspiration and counsel can we turn than to the imperishable truth to be found in this treasure house, the Bible? In court, you would be asked to put your hand upon the Bible and say, I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Shops closed on Sunday in recognition of the Lord's Day when so many went to their church. Holidays were generally based on Christian holy days. Children went to Sunday school. Schools had morning assembly where prayers were said and hymns were sung. Christian ministers taught religion education classes in the schools. Missionaries went to foreign fields and society held them in the highest esteem. David Livingstone, William Carey, Donoram Judson, Hudson Taylor, Amy Carmichael, George Mueller, Eric Little, Jim Elliot. Marriage was between a man and a woman because the Bible said so and society agreed. Killing unwanted babies in the womb was wrong because the Bible said so and society agreed. Men having sex with men and women with women was wrong because the Bible said so and society agreed. Men lusting after women and pornography was wrong because the Bible said so and society agreed. Sex without marriage and outside of marriage was wrong because the Bible said so and society agreed. Divorce was a last painful resort, not an automatic right, because the Bible said so and society agreed. But Christendom is gone, 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 gone. The centuries-old Western culture that had Christianity as its bedrock and legal framework has undergone a colossal and rapid change. The new moral revolution allows people to believe that their own lusts and passions are the basis for personal morality. In the blink of an eye, the gospel has become an offense to many. Christians are increasingly being ridiculed and marginalized. Scripture's moral compass, gender identification, and behavioral boundaries are now an offense. The most aggressive opponents know what God's right, righteous judgment is because they vocally rail against it and at times persecute Christians for declaring it and honoring it. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans 1.32, Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, that they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. And so, although we would never want to offend, we must realize with complete and settled clarity that many will be offended by what we believe and live out and declare as truth. 
we are or should be disciples of Jesus. And he warned in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. Indeed it did. One Bible commentator wrote, the Gospels appear to report two different trials of Jesus. One was before the religious authorities when he was charged with a religious offense. The other was before Pontius Pilate where he was charged with a political offense. As genuine followers of Christ, we must not compromise or weaken the impact of what his word clearly and unmistakably declares. For instance, heaven is very real, and so is God's coming judgment, and so is hell. Jesus, the most loving, compassionate man, God-man, ever to walk this earth, said that again and again and again, and yet often we teach one and hide the other because <coughs> hell is offensive. And because sometimes we ourselves are even offended by the thought of it being real. In everything where it is lovingly applicable, we must be courageous enough to declare the whole counsel of God. As Paul wrote to the church in Acts 20, 27, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. We lose our saltiness, and as Jesus warned, when salt loses its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. The apostle Peter wrote to the church, Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. It is important to understand that in every way possible, without compromising the gospel and a high view of Scripture, we are not to give offense by our behavior. Paul wrote to the church in 1 Corinthians 10, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And he wrote to the church at Corinth in 2 at Corinth Corinthians 6, We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses. If we are to be salt and light, we must not shrink back for fear of the truth offending as long as it is lovingly spoken to a darkening world with passion and not aggression. Just as Jesus was a friend of sinners, so must we be. But a friend, if appropriate, must at some stage bring the plumb line of truth. Because being a friend of sinners must never be confused with being a friend of sin. Jesus could have condemned the woman caught in adultery by the Pharisees, but he didn't. He befriended her, and he defended her, and probably saved her life, as recorded in John 8. One by one they left until Jesus was left alone with her. Woman, where are they? Jesus said, has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. God's truth will, as Paul states, be an aroma of life to some and an aroma of death, death to others. As the heat rises, many non-offensive variations on kingdom teachings will be, will be proclaimed from some pulpits, which is cowardly and an offense to God. Remember Jesus' words to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. As Christianity starts to cost, fans will leave and followers will stay. And persecution will come in increasing levels of severity. Already some have lost their jobs because of their refusal to compromise on morality or on their commitment to being salt and light in a darkening culture. Soon the gospel message and various Bible passages may be labeled hate crimes. Many street preachers are being harassed and even arrested by the authorities after people have claimed that their message is offensive. But as they say, here's the thing. Throughout history, the true church has always been persecuted for righteousness' sake. 
Think of the fate of the apostles and the early Christians. When you stood for Christ, you embraced the fact that you and your family might be put to death or have to flee into exile. For instance, in the, fift- <clears throat> for instance, in the 15th and 16th century, <clears throat> many died at the stake for their unwavering belief in Scripture, which caused great offense. Records show that 288 people in England were burnt at the stake during the three years 1555 to 1558. Many at Cambridge University paid the price for their belief in the integrity of Scripture. There were in all 25 men who were sons of Cambridge who died in the cause of the Reformation, and a much larger number were exiled. During the reign of Queen Mary, there were 472 people listed as exiles for their stand, of which around 90 were Cambridge men. A monument was erected at Greyfriars Kirkyard in Edinburgh, near the open ground known as the Covenanters' Prison, stating that 18,000 Covenanters were killed in the period 1661 to 1680 for their unwavering belief in Scripture as the sole infallible rule of faith and practice. But despite horrific persecution then and today, think of Sudan, Nigeria, Somalia, Pakistan, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Indonesia, North Korea, etc., the kingdom goes marching on. Hi. Revelation 12:11 gives us that answer. And they overcame him, that's the God of this world, that's Satan. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. I heard one speaker recently say, only if we are willing to die for Jesus will we be able to suffer the world's hatred. He's probably right. The spiritual forecast is for stormy weather ahead, and we need to be dressed appropriately. Western Christendom is now dead. Aggressive atheism is alive and sweeping all before it. The resultant fruit in our society is hard to watch as it unfolds with equal rapidity. But in the midst of this rapid moral breakdown, the true church of Jesus Christ is alive because it is the body of Christ. We have been born for such a time as this, called to be salt and light, and we must not be found wanting. When and where the church has been hated and persecuted, it has always emerged stronger. An Egyptian Christian said, In the east where we suffer persecution, the church is united and strong. In the west where there has been no persecution, the church has been divided and weak. It is the west turn now. The apostle Paul certainly understood persecution and joyfully wrote, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Don't just be a fan. Be a follower.